Good morning, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning for the Winship Grand Rounds. A uh, few housekeeping items first before we start. Uh, if you're an Emory University or healthcare employee and you would like to receive a CME credit for attending the uh, session, uh, the login information can be found in the chat feature on the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar uh, or the CME login, please send uh, Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note in the Zoom chat box. This morning, we're very excited uh, to have and welcome Dr. Lori Wirth. Dr. Wirth is the Elizabeth and Michael Ruane Chair of Endocrine Oncology and is Associate Professor in Medicine at Harvard Medical School and joined Massachusetts General Hospital in 2008 to become the Medical Director for the Center of Head and Neck Cancers. She attended Brown University as an undergraduate, then obtained her MD from Columbia and uh, then graduated with distinction and being nominated to the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. She subsequently did her fellowship in hematology oncology at Harvard, State of Harbor, Mass General Brigham Center, uh, and was on staff in the head neck oncology at the Dana Farber uh, Cancer Center in Boston before she moved to uh, Mass General. Dr. Worth is a leading expert in head and neck oncology. Uh, initially, uh, she worked extensively on induction chemotherapy, uh, and more recently, she focused on thyroid cancers. Uh, she sits on national and international committees that guide treatment of thyroid cancer, uh, and this is now her main research uh, effort. Uh, we look very much look forward to her. I'm sure will be excellent talk. Uh, welcome, Dr. Worth. Thank you, Dr. Saba. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I wish I was there with you in person. Um, we were chit-chatting before uh, the the webinar got started. That it's 28 degrees in in Boston today, and and uh, I'm sure that it's warmer uh, in uh, in Atlanta. So. Um, I wish I was there with you all doing this in person, but um, thank you very much. Um, I am going to talk about thyroid cancer today. There's been a lot of um, a lot of really interesting developments uh, uh, recently that I that I uh, will enjoy talking about with everyone today. Um, this slide shows my disclosures, um, and. You know, one of the reasons that I really like uh, uh, taking care of patients with advanced thyroid cancer is that there is really a wide array of diseases. Um, so um, uh, there um, are follicular thyroid cancers, papillary, follicular, herthal cell, poorly differentiated thyroid cancers, even anaplastic thyroid cancers that are follicular derived. There are medullary thyroid cancers. These cancers can all have very different natural histories and different biologies. Um, so it's a really interesting field. And I'm gonna talk about um, all of these entities to some extent today. Um, so basically in the last 10 years, we are, our new therapies for advanced iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer have involved, have, have involved um, the use of VEGFR multikinase inhibitors. Um, the two drugs that are FDA approved for the treatment of iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer are serafinib and lenvatinib. And this slide here shows just the top line results from the two trials, decision and select with both of the two drugs. Both of these studies um, enroll patients with progressive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer and randomized patients to the active drug versus placebo um, with progression-free survival as the primary endpoint with crossover at the time of, of disease progression in the patient that were enrolled in, in the placebo. And you can see here with these <clears throat> Kaplan-Meier progression-free survival curves that um, both of the trials were successful in improving the progression-free survival with uh, uh, the drug compared to placebo, whether it's serafinib um, compared to placebo or lenvatinib compared to placebo. With serafinib, the, the median progression-free survival benefit was five months. With lenvatinib, it was 14 months. The overall response rate with serafinib was 12%. With lenvatinib, it was 65%. So both of these drugs are our current standard of care therapies for iodine refractory DTC. 
Now for medullary thyroid cancer, we also have VEGFR multikinase inhibitors that are FDA approved, um, namely vandetinib and cabozatinib. Um, and and this, these two Kaplan-Meier curves show the top line results for the Zeta trial and the exam trial that studied respectively vandetinib and cabozatinib. Again, with similar designs where um, patients were randomized to the active drug versus placebo. Um, one quirk of the Zeta trial with vandetinib Nib is that patients didn't have to have disease progression at study entry. And so um, there were patients enrolled with relatively indolent disease. And so you can see with the placebo curve that there's a pretty long um, progression-free survival in the vandetinib trial because of that particular um, aspect of the study design. Um, but again, um, both of the, these trials uh, randomized patients to the drug versus placebo, and we saw a significant improvement in progression free survival with both vandetinib and cabozatinib compared to placebo in medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, with vandetinib, the PFS benefit is 11 months. With, with cabozatinib, the PFS benefit was seven months. And with vandetinib, the uh, overall response rate was 45% in, in patients with MTC. And in, in cabozatinib, the overall response rate was 28%. Um, so uh, these two drugs are FDA approved for uh, the treatment of, of uh, advanced uh, medullary thyroid cancer. So the way that these drugs work is that they, um, they inhibit multiple kinases. Um, uh, these kinome dendrograms here represent all of the, the, the leaf-like fronds represent all of the kinases present in the human body. And then the dots on the fronds um, represent the kinases that are inhibited by the particular drugs. Um, so with uh, cabozatinib, you can see here um, that there is, um, uh, the blue dot is, is KDR or VEGFR2, the green dot is RET, um, other kinases in the, in the red dots. Um, so this is, uh, you know, a, a Multi, a multi-kinase inhibitor, and we think that a lot of the action from, cap, from all of these drugs comes from the inhibition of KDR or VEGFR2. Um, but also uh, a common theme is that all of these drugs have um, do target RET to some degree. Here's the green dot with vandetinib. <clears throat> with uh, lenvatinib, it's a stronger VEGFR KDR2 inhibitor. It also has a little bit stronger inhibition of, of RET as well. Um, so, um, I think in part because of the multiple kinases that are inhibited with the multi-kinase inhibitors, we do see treatment-related adverse events uh, with this class of drugs. Um, so the common side effects that we deal with with the this class of, of VEGFR multikinase inhibitors um, include uh, palmer plantar erythrodysesthesia, which you can see here really can be quite uh, impactful on patients. Diarrhea is not uncommon, anorexia, weight loss, fatigue, hypertension. QTC prolongation is also a common theme, although it's, it, it's also a theme, although it's relatively uncommon. Um, it is a little, seen a little bit more frequently with vandetinib. Um, bleeding and thromboembolism um, are also seen uncommonly, and even the risk of fistula uh, can be seen uncommonly with this class of drugs. So in the trials that I mentioned, um, th uh, these side effects are managed by dose holds and dose reductions. So the dose reductions in the, uh, those various four studies range from 64 to 79 percent uh, with the various MKIs. And treatment discontinuation also is necessary in a percentage of patients. In the serafinib DTC study, it was 19 percent with lenvatinib, 14 percent. In the MTC studies with vandetinib and, and cabozatinib, the treatment discontinuation rates were 12 and 16 percent. So what we have learned also in the last decade is that thyroid cancer is really a really rich in potentially druggable targets. Um, there's a diverse spectrum of potentially druggable targets as well in thyroid cancer, and it varies from subtype to subtype. Um, so in papillary thyroid cancer, the most common uh, mutation is in BRAF V600E, the same mutation that drives a, a significant percentage of, of melanoma. Uh, cases. Um, we also, however, see other um, alterations in papillary thyroid cancer. Follicular thyroid cancers are, are most commonly driven by RAS mutations. We don't yet have 
great drugs that, that target all of the known RAS mutations, but I think we're getting there. Um, Herthel cell is, is unique. We used to think of it as a subtype of follicular thyroid cancer, but we now know based on the, the uh, 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 genomic component as well as the mitochondrial DNA um, that th this is its own um, subtype of, of thyroid cancer, not a, a subtype of the follicular thyroid cancers. Poorly differentiated thyroid cancers can arise out of any of the earlier subtypes that I mentioned and can have the similar um, uh, uh, driver alterations with additional mutations, including um, in, in the EIF1AX, for example. Um, and then th um, anaplastic thyroid cancer can de-differentiate out of all of these other cancers and really have all of those mutations, as well as har frequently harboring mutations in, in um, P53. So when we think about it, in fact, thyroid cancer is, um, is uh, the, the druggable targets in thyroid cancer are actually incredibly common. So um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a, a, an NCCN uh, call with our colleagues, and they, uh, there was discussion about whether we should be doing any NGS testing in, in thyroid cancer patients or not because of the, the uncommon nature of, of, of druggable alterations that we can find in, in these tumors. But when we look at the data, actually, um, a thyroid cancer is one, of the, is one of the cancers, one of the solid tumors that, that has the highest frequency of potentially druggable targets. So so this study was uh, done by a group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. They sequenced with their, their next generation platform more than 10,000 tumors and um, identified all of the clinically relevant somatic alterations um, that um, either had drugs that were FDA approved or drugs that were in clinical trials for patients. And this um, chart here on the right shows that um, GI stromal tumors had the most, the highest rate of, of, of potentially druggable targets and thyroid cancer was number two. So I think we've got a good rationale here um, uh, to um, be doing NGS testing in our patients with advanced thyroid cancer who need systemic therapy. Um, and I think it's also important to point out that thyroid cancer is really a poster child for fusion-driven cancer. So when you look across all of the solid tumors that were sequenced in the TCGA uh, uh, program, papillary thyroid cancer has the highest rate of recurrent oncogenic kinase fusions um, of all solid tumors that were studied in TCGA. So there's really a prominent role for kinase fusions um, in, in thyroid cancer tumorigenesis, um, and, and thyroid cancer really um, has the highest rate overall of fusions um, that are potentially druggable. Um, so we see RET fusions here on this chart and TREK here, just as examples. So where have we, uh, where, ha where have we come in terms of gene-specific therapy in, in, in uh, advanced thyroid cancer. Um, we've made some progress uh, with BRAF, but perhaps not quite enough, but then there's other progress as well. But I'll start with BRAF because it is the most common mutation that we see in thyroid cancer. Um, so, so we did a study, um, uh, uh, Manisha Shah was the principal investigator of the study, and this was an NCCN sponsored study of patients with iodine refractory BRAF mutant papillary thyroid cancer. 53 patients were enrolled and patients were um, randomized to debrafenib alone versus debrafenib and trametinib. And what you can see here in the overall uh, response rates with debrafenib or the combination therapy was 50% and 54%. Um, so fairly robust activity, although not as high as we've seen necessarily with lenvatinib in the same patient population. Um, and then PFS um, with one drug versus two drugs was 11.4 months and, and 15.1 months. So the waterfall plot here shows a pretty good activity of, of the therapy. Um, Overall, uh, we didn't see a, a significant difference in the side effect profile of one drug versus both drugs um, in this patient population. Um, so it's really not clear that there's a, a benefit to the doublet versus single agent therapy. Um, and it's also not clear that BRAF directed therapy in iodine refractory um, PTC is better than the FDA approved VEGFR multikinase inhibitor therapy. So generally what I do is use lenvatinib um, first in these patients, um, but think about using debrafenib plus or minus trametinib when I can get access to it off-label in patients who've progressed on, on lenvatinib. 
Now, the story is a little bit different in BRAF mutant anaplastic thyroid cancer. So approximately 33% of all anaplastic thyroid cancers harbor BRAF V600E mutations. These, these are probably anaplastic thyroid cancers that are de-differentiated from a papillary thyroid cancer. And um, a basket trial run by the Rare Cancers Agnostic Re Research Program studied dibrafenib and trametinib in BRAF mutant solid tumors that were not melanomas. There were 16 patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer that were enrolled in this basket trial that was reported by Vivek Subeya from, from uh, MD Anderson. And in this 16 patient cohort of, of anaplastic patients, there was a 63% overall response rate, which in anaplastic thyroid cancer is incredibly gratifying. Um, and what you can see here in the swimmer's plot that many of these responses were very durable. So the estimated overall Survival of these patients with metastatic disease at 12 months was 80%, uh, which is a lot better than four to six months in patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, and here you see uh, the requisite CT scan of, of a patient uh, uh, who responded really quite nicely after just two cycles of dibrafenib and trametinib. Um, and I didn't really quite believe these data um, had I uh, or I wouldn't necessarily believe these data had I not um, uh, treated a number of patients uh, since the FDA approval of this therapy for anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, but I have also had uh, uh, some really great results, although unfortunately not with everyone. I think one thing about this study that is important to mention is that the pathology was not centrally reviewed um, for these 16 patients. Um, so did every single one of these 16 patients really have anaplastic thyroid cancer? We don't know that for sure. Um, but Nonetheless, um, dibrafenib and trametinib are FDA approved for uh, BRAF mutant anaplastic thyroid cancer. Now, what about RET? So um, um, just a, a brief review of RET. RET is a, a proto-oncogene that encodes a transmembrane receptor tyrosine kinase. Um, so it sounds deliciously druggable, um, and indeed it is. Um, so one thing that's unique about RET is that um, as a kinase, it doesn't um, homodimerize exactly with itself like most other tyrosine kinases do, um, but it forms a complex with, with this um, GDNF uh, family co-receptor alpha um, with um, when, when the GDNF family ligands bind to that co-receptor, then you get a complex of homodimerization and activation of, of wild-type RET and then signal transduction through these um, pathways that we know and love in oncology shown here below. Now, RET is activated in thyroid cancer in two distinct, by two distinct mechanisms. We see RET fusions in medullary thyroid cancers, and those fusions can occur in the cysteine-rich extracellular domain here that leads to disulfide bonds, um, causing homodimerization without the ligand binding and, um, and uh, uh, constitutive activation that way. Um, or we see also in medullary thyroid cancers um, activating RET mutations in the kinase domain domain itself, um, uh, RET, M90, RET M918T um, uh, is uh, the canonical uh, mutation in, in MTC uh, in the active kinase domain. Um, that's con constitutively activated without necessarily needing to homodimerize. Um, and then um, uh, we can see RET fusions um, in the follicular dry thyroid cancer where RET is, is bound to a five prime upstream partner that leads to um, fusion of the, of the protein um, intracytosolically and activation that way. So RET mutations drive 70% of all medullary thyroid cancers. 25% of medullary thyroid cancers are hereditary, and essentially all of these patients have germline RET mutations. But also 60% of sporadic medullary thyroid cancers harbor somatic RET mutations in the tumor, not germline. RET M918T is the most common somatic mutation that's seen, and as I mentioned, that's in the tyrosine kinase domain. And then germline RET M918T mutations are seen in nearly all MEN2B patients that have hereditary medullary thyroid cancer. And then RET C634 is the most common hereditary mutation, and that is one of the MEN2A mutations that we see. But this mutation can also occur um, uh, uh, somatically, and that's in the extracellular cysteine-rich domain. 
So there's a really interesting genotype-phenotype correlation uh, in medullary thyroid cancer. We see this both in hereditary thyroid cancer, but also in the, the sporadic MTCs. Um, and so this busy chart here um, shows the most common germline RET mutations, and then the risk of developing medullary thyroid cancer earlier in life, um, pheochromocytomas, hyperparathyroidisms, cutaneous lichen amyloidosis, and also Hirschsprung's disease. And so if we take, for example, the RET M918T, which um, is associated with, medular, uh, with, um, with MEN2B, and we can see that this has the highest uh, risk of developing uh, medullary thyroid cancer very early in life. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the, um, these patients can have medullary thyroid cancer within the first one or two years of life. So these babies need to be identified and have a prophylactic thyroidectomy before they're one year of old in order to prevent them from getting this otherwise potentially deadly disease. Um, MEN2B patients um, also have a, a typical marfanoid body habitus, as you can see here with this patient of mine. You can see her long facies there. They also have aerodigestive tract uh, ganglioneuromas you can see in her tongue and in her lips, um, also in the eyelids here in the conjunctiva. Um, they have them in the, in the bowel that causes um, problems um, um, with bowel obstruction. She's had multiple surgeries due to bowel obstruction. And you can see here that she doesn't have adrenal glands because she had bilateral adrenalectomies for bilateral pheochromocytomas. But we also see not only a genotype-phenotype correlation in the familial um, MEN2A and 2B syndromes, we also see that in patients with sporadic disease. Uh, so for example, the MEN, I'm sorry, uh, the RET M918T mutation is most common um, um, in patients with sporadic MTC, and those patients have a worse prognosis with more aggressive medullary thyroid cancer. In terms of RET fusion positive thyroid cancer, we see RET fusions in less than 10% of, of papillary thyroid cancers overall, but it's important to know that these fusions are more frequent in pediatric and young adult patients with thyroid cancer. Um, that group of patients have about 30%, a rate of 30% of RET fusion positive thyroid cancer. And we see RET fusions even more commonly in thyroid cancers that are induced by radiation, such as in the Chernobyl pediatric patients um, that have radiation-induced thyroid cancer. So CCDC6 is the most common RET fusion partner that we see, and then NCOA4 is the second most co common fusion partner. But there have now been more than 20 five prime fusion partners that have been described with RET in thyroid cancers. So when you're using an assay to look for RET fusions, you wanna make sure that your assay picks up not just the most common fusions that are seen, but also the uncommon ones as well, because you don't wanna miss a, 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 a less common five prime fusion partner and um, because your assay is only looking for um, CCDC6 or NCOA4 RET fusions. And now we have um, two RET specific uh, agents that have completed their first in human trials um, and um, have been reported, um, um, the sulpercatinib data have been reported recently in New England Journal of Medicine and prosetinib has recently been reported at, at ESMO. So I'm gonna talk about these two drugs. Um, this kinome dendrogram here is for sulpercatinib or LOXO292. Um, both of these drugs were designed to potently and specifically inhibit RET as much as possible and, and not inhibit any other kinases. You do see a little bit of other kinase inhib inhibition with salpercatinib, um, so it's not a perfect uh, RET-specific agent, but it's pretty close. It's a pretty clean drug, and prosatinib's uh, kinome dendrogram would look very similarly. They were both designed to potently um, inhibit both the, the wild-type RET fusions uh, or uh, wild type RET kinase that we see in the fusions in, in papillary thyroid cancers, as well as in, uh, in slightly less than 5% of all non small cell lung cancers. Um, uh, both drugs were also designed to inhibit the oncogenic RET mutations that we see in medullary thyroid cancer, including RET V804, which had been hypothesized to serve as an acquired gatekeeper resistance mutation that would emerge on treatment with the multi kinase inhibitor 
inhibitors that do target RET, such as cabozatinib and vendetinib. We now have seen those reports um, of, of, of this uh, acquired gatekeeper resistance mutation emerging in patients. So that hypothesis was correct. Um, so basically, the idea of both selpercatinib and, and pralcetinib were um, to design drugs that um, were um, potent and specific for RET because the efficacy of the other multikinase inhibitors that do have some RET activity is probably limited by insufficient RET inhibition because of the toxicity of the other off-target effects being dose limiting, um, particularly at KDR or VEGFR2. So the Libretto 001 trial was an open-label phase 1-2 trial of selpercatinib in RET-driven non-small cell lung cancer and thyroid cancers and other RET-driven cancers. Um, this has been reported, as I mentioned, recently in New England Journal. Um, and I'm going to show you the thyroid data. Overall in the study, there were 531 patients that were enrolled. The three thyroid cohorts were RET mutant medullary thyroid cancer patients that had been previously treated with vendetta and or cabozatinib. This was considered the primary analysis set. There was also a RET mutant MTC cohort of patients that had not previously received vendetinib or cabozatinib. And then there was a cohort of patients with RET fusion positive, previously treated uh, follicular derived advanced thyroid cancer. So of the RET mutant uh, patients that had been previously treated with CABO and or vendetinib, there were 55 patients in that cohort. 60% of the patients did have RET M918T mutations, and then 13% had extracellular cysteine-rich domain mutations. Um, both familial and sporadic patients were enrolled because sporadic uh, uh, MTC is more common. There were more uh, uh, sporadic patients enrolled, of course. And then in the RET mutant patients that had um, not previously been treated with CABO or vendetinib, there were 88 patients in that cohort. And then in the RET fusion positive thyroid cancer patients, there were 19 patients, and the histologies were papillary thyroid cancer, poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, there were two patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer, and then one patient with HERTHO cell. And, and the CCDC6 RET fusion was most common as expected. This shows the safety profile of, um, the, of uh, uh, salpercatinib in the thyroid cancer patients that were enrolled in the trial. And the busy chart shows the adverse events that were reported in 15% of patients or more. And just if you eyeball the chart, you can see that most of the adverse events that were reported were grade one and grade two. The most common treatment really related grade three or grade four adverse events were hypertension, transaminitis, and diarrhea. 30% of the selpercatinib patients had to have dose reductions due to treatment-related adverse events, but only 2% of patients had to have dose discontinuation due to um, treatment-related adverse events. So overall, a pretty favorable safety prof profile. And here you can see the efficacy in terms of overall response rate. Um, the up, the um, waterfall plot on the top shows that primary analysis set of patients um, with MTC that had been previously treated with vanzatinib, cabozantinib, or both. So the bars are color-coded, um, each bar is representing a patient. Um, the light blue bar is representing patients that had had vanzatinib. The green bars are cabozantinib. The purple bars are patients that had, had received both. And as you can see here, um, there was a, a a, a good overall response rate of 69% in this patient population. And we even had 9% of patients with complete responses. And then the bottom shows that um, the waterfall plot for patients with RET mutant MTC that had not been previously treated. And we saw an overall response rate of 73% in those patients with a complete response rate of 11%. And I don't have um, the uh, pictorial data sh to show this here, but we did see responses across all of the RET mutations um, uh, in patients that were enrolled, including in patients that did harbor that acquired gatekeeper resistance mutation at RET V804. Um, we saw very durable uh, responses as well. So in the primary analysis set, the median duration of response and median progression-free survival had not yet been reached at a median follow-up of 14.1 months and 16.7 months respectively. 
In the RET fusion positive thyroid cancer, those 19 patients, um, here you see the waterfall plot showing the responses. Um, this is color coded to show the histology. So the gray bars are papillary thyroid cancers. Um, I like to point out this uh, yellow bar, which is actually a patient of mine with anaplastic thyroid cancer enrolled on the study. Um, this patient uh, with uh, RET fusion driven anaplastic thyroid cancer um, has had a beautiful response and, and remains in response uh, uh, at the present time. The overall Overall response rate in this uh, group of patients was 79%, and the median duration of response in this group of patients was 18.4 um, months. So it was on the basis of the Libretto 001 um, data that, that selpercatinib has now been FDA approved for RET fusion uh, driven lung cancer and RET altered thyroid cancers um, that, uh, uh, for patients who have advanced disease and are in need of treatment. Um, and I think it's important to note that this is a line agnostic approval uh, in both lung cancer and, uh, and in thyroid cancer. Now, in terms of the prosetinib data, um, the ARO trial was a similar, uh, similarly designed trial to Libretto 001, where patients uh, were enrolled in this um, uh, first in human phase one, two trial. Um, Mimi Hu has presented the, the, um, the final results of the thyroid cancer patients at ESMO, and I'll show you those data here. Um, there were patients who um, uh, received prior uh, vandetinib and cabozantinib, and then there were a group of, of 22 patients who had not had prior therapy. There is a similar um, a rate of M, RET M919T mutations in, in, in the ARO trial. This waterfall plot in the previously treated um, um, patients with MTC shows um, a lot of responses. Again, um, the overall response rate here with prosetinib was uh, 60%, um, and there were um, patients, 2% of patients with um, complete responses. In the, uh, this shows the uh, prolonged uh, median duration of response and PFS that also had not yet been reached at the time of presentation uh, of the ARO trial in MTC patients. This waterfall plot here um, shows an overall response rate of 74% in patients with MTC that had not previously received any prior systemic therapy with a 5% uh, uh, complete response rate. Um, in terms of the safety profile of prosetinib, um, it's fairly similar with most of the um, grade one and grade two treatment related adverse events. Um, uh, 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 being uh, reversible. Um, we do see um, slightly higher um, bone marrow toxicity with pralcetinib compared to, to selpercatinib um, with more leukopenia, uh, neutropenia being reported and a little bit of um, uh, anemia being reported as well. Overall, 4% of patients had to have dose discontinuation of pralcetinib uh, due to treatment related adverse events. But RET isn't the only fusion that we have that's druggable uh, in thyroid cancer. There's also NTREC. Um, so let me show you that data very briefly. Um, NTREC um, is another tyrosine kinase um, that's expressed uncommonly in multiple tissues. So we see it across multiple uh, different solid tumors at low rates. And we see it in 2% of patients with papillary thyroid cancers. And we see um, um, primarily NTREC1 or NTREC3 fusions. And this chart here here shows, um, again, that with NTREC, we have multiple fusion partners um, that can be seen. So again, you need to have an assay that can pick up um, all of these diverse fusion partners. And it's, of course, this um, uh, fusion that leads to constitutive activation of TREC uh, in the uh, TREC uh, fusion-driven uh, uh, cancers that we see. Um, so overall, there, there were um, uh, several different larotrectinib uh, uh, trials that enrolled patients with NTREC fusion positive solid tumors. Um, and that um, data has been reported several times. It's recently been reported um, by Hong and colleagues in Lancet Oncology, where all of the data have been pooled of all of the 153 patients that have uh, uh, been studied so far. So overall, you can see an, uh, a response rate of 79%. Um, um, uh, with uh, larotrectinib in, in NTREC fusion driven cancer with a median duration of response of 35% and a pretty tolerable safety profile. Now, 
Thyroid cancer was the second most common adult tumor type that was enrolled in the lirotrectinib experience. Um, and um, Maria Cabanillas recently showed these data at, at ESMO, um, summarizing um, the thyroid cancer experience in the lirotrectinib trials. Um, so there were 28 patients overall, 21 with DTC, and seven patients with anaplastic thyroid cancer. In the DTC patients, the overall response rate was 90%. In anaplastic, the overall response rate was only only 29%. Um, that's pretty good for anaplastic thyroid cancer, but kind of disappointing relative to the other NTREC fusion um, cancers um, on lerotrectinib. Um, but lerotrectinib is FDA approved. Um, lerotrectinib received the first tumor agnostic approval in oncology by the FDA. Um, and, and this is now, I think, a new standard of care for patients with NTREC fusion driven thyroid cancer. Um, I'm going to see if I have enough time to do a case. I think I do. Um, Nabil, you can stop me if I, if I don't. Um, but I'm just going to dive right in um, because you're not stopping me. So this is a patient um, who is a 57-year-old man who was diagnosed with medullary thyroid cancer, who I saw for a second opinion in November of 2018. He was diagnosed in May of 2018, um, had, a, had a neck lump, FNH of medullary thyroid cancer. He had a total thyroidectomy, um, bilateral and upper mediastinal neck dissections. Um, he had extensive medullary thyroid cancer um, with extensive intrathyroidal extension, angioinvasion, extrathyroidal spread, multi multifocal positive margins. He had numerous nodes. Um, so this is um, very um, high grade disease. Um, he had metastatic workup after surgery with liver lesions that were positive for medullary thyroid cancer on FNA. So the outside um, uh, group sent a foundation one NGS testing and he was found to have have a RET M918T mutation, as well as mutation in CCDCN1 and FGFR amplification. Um, he was enrolled in a clinical trial investigating combination immunotherapy in across different types of thyroid cancers um, with ipilimumab and nivolumab. He had one dose of ipinevo and developed autoimmune hepatitis and pancreatitis, um, so he was discontinued from this therapy. Um, shortly thereafter, he had diplopia and a brain MRI showed a left cavernous sinus mass that was treated with SRS. Then in August of 2018, he was started on cabozatinib. This is lower than the FDA approved dose, but, but the um, FDA approved dose of 140 milligrams daily is thought to be a really high dose for, for patients. After just two cycles of therapy, his uh, restaging showed, showed progressive disease um, in the thoracic spine and also in the liver. So you can see here on this MRI, it's not actually just limited to the thoracic spine. He has extensive bony disease. You can see here on this liver MRI, extensive infiltration of the liver. And then he had rise, rising calcitonin levels as well from 101 to 276. And note, these calcitonin levels are actually um, very low um, uh, given how much disease he has. So these calcitonin levels being low out of proportion to the extent of disease actually is an indicator of a de-differentiated, very aggressive medullary thyroid cancer, which this patient did indeed have. So he came to our center in November of 2018. His performance status was one. He had grade three transaminitis and grade two hyperbilirubinemia that we attributed to uh, liver infiltration. Um, he had that RET M918T mutation on foundation one. So, so we would have loved to have put him on either the Libretto 001 or Aero trials, but he was ineligible because of his liver disease. Um, so we pursued a single patient protocol through LOXO Oncology to get access to LOXO 29 or salpercatinib, and that was approved by LOX Oncology and the FDA. We also rolled out a, a germline ret mutation um, in this patient. Um, he, um, not only because it's pertinent to him, but because uh, uh, it would be pertinent to his first degree family members, his kids and his siblings. And fortunately, he does not have MEN2B. We pretty much knew that because he didn't have the phenotype, but you really wanna be 100% sure. Unfortunately, while we were pursuing the single patient protocol, which we were working on as quickly as possible, and my team was really amazing at how, how quickly they pushed it through, his condition deteriorated really rapidly. Um, it took us about two and a half weeks to get it through Lox Oncology, the FDA, and our IRB. During that time, he developed nausea, vomiting. He became encephalopathic. On the day before Thanksgiving, that's why I have November 21st there. The day before Thanksgiving, it was approved. We had the drug in our pharmacy. 
Um, we started him at a 50% uh, uh, dose of salpicatinib because of the liver dysfunction. He came in in a stretcher, and like I said, he was encephalopathic. We somehow got the drug in him, um, and um, he had a remarkable um, quick response. Um, he came into clinic um, on Monday, the day the, after the, the Thanksgiving holiday. He w walked in. He was no longer on a stretcher. Um, so after two cycles, we did restaging. You can see here some improvement um, in the liver disease that was measured by RESIST as a 15% uh, reduction. And you can see that there, there's some sclerosis of those diffuse lytic lesions in the bones. Um, his calcitonin and CEA levels dropped dramatically as well. Um, so he remained in response for 17 months um, and um, was, uh, did great, um, was really asymptomatic um, for those 17 months until he developed some confusion. We did a, a brain MRI and he had diffuse brain mats. Um, you can see here um, in April, um, his calcitonin and CEA levels had jumped up as well. So we sent off Gardent 360 since we couldn't biopsy the brain mets to see if we could um, see why he's progressing with some acquired resistance mutation. Um, and you can see here uh, with the Gardent 360 uh, liquid biopsy in the circulating tumor DNA, um, this is at study entry. So you can see a big blip for um, the RET M918T. He also did have um, arid uh, 1A mutation and other mutations as well. Um, the RET M918 mutation went away on therapy. Um, you can see that the ARID1A uh, mutation never uh, did go away, interestingly enough. Um, and then, um, and then um, after January, um, the RET, uh, M918T mutation is emerging again in his liquid biopsy, um, but we're not seeing other acquired resistance mutations um, identified. We now know from studying um, a, a number of patients, um, we, we took a look at 20 patients um, with a couple of other centers of patients that had been enrolling on salpicatinib or prosatinib uh, trials. So in these 20 patients um, that, that developed resistance, acquired resistance on one of these two drugs, 10% um, of patients were identified to have um, solvent front mutations in RET at, at GA10. And that solvent front mutation basically blocks the drug salpercatinib from getting into that kinase domain and binding and inhibiting um, the kinase there. Um, um, we also saw 15% of patients with developing uh, MET amplification um, as a way of, of uh, acquired resistance. Um, and then there was one patient with a KRAS amplification. Um, so um, potentially druggable alterations are emerging as acquired resistance, but unfortunately our patients did not have any of these um, alterations. Um, we are learning more about acquired resistance on RET. Um, Vivek Subaya um, and his group at MD Anderson have a paper that's in press um, reporting on the development of a hinge uh, mutation. So rather at, than at the kinase solvent front at the hinge, um, there are, are now um, identified in two patients this um, RET um, Y806 mutation in the hinge that causes resistance um, to um, two patients that were treated um, with salpicatinib, one with medullary thyroid cancer and one with, um, with uh, uh, CCDC6 ret fusion positive non-small cell lung cancer. We still need to learn more, of course, about the uh, acquired resistance on these two RET inhibitors because we're, all, we're still accounting for just a minority of patients um, who develop acquired resistance um, on salpicatinib or pralcetinib. So getting back to our patient, so um, we now have um, the um, uh, 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 first, second generation RET-specific inhibitor in phase one trial. Um, and this patient has now enrolled on TPX0046. Um, this drug is a small and comp compact uh, TKI, um, and it was designed as a potent and specific RET and SARC inhibitor um, so that it would uh, inhibit a wild type RET SARC and also the acquired solvent front G810 mutation, uh, which is shown here. 
This is the acquired gatekeeper resistance mutation, 804. Um, you can see that the drug, in theory, shouldn't, bind, shouldn't block uh, uh, cancers with that uh, um, acquired resistance mutation. Um, but anyway, so our patient is now enrolled in this phase one trial, um, and um, we'll have to hope for the best. Um, he actually just had restaging yesterday. Uh, so, um, also in terms of future directions um, for RET um, in thyroid cancer, um, the um, Libretto 531 trial is now open internationally. This is a multicenter randomized phase three trial comparing selpercatinib to physician's choice, either capozantinib or vandetinib in patients with progressive uh, RET mutant medullary thyroid cancer. Um, patients are randomized in a two to one ratio to selpercatinib versus dealer's choice, vandetinib or, oops, sorry, uh, that's a typo there, it should be cabozantinib. Um, and the, the, there's a unique primary endpoint here that the FDA agreed to, which is treatment failure-free survival. That's a compositive, composite endpoint of uh, progression um, and uh, 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 treatment discontinuation due to treatment-related adverse events. Um, so um, in, this is an open label study um, because it was felt that we would be able to tell who's on uh, selpercatinib and who's on vandetinib or cabozantinib. So um, when patients um, progress or have treatment failure um, on vandetinib or cabozantinib, they'll be able to cross over and receive selpercatinib. Um, so this is an important phase three trial that is now open. Um, you know, we speculate that it may be difficult with the FDA approval in the U.S. to enroll in the trial, but nonetheless, I think that the, the trial is important. And, and, you know, questions that um, um, are, are, are critical in, in knowing how do we best use all of these active agents. Um, and, and one of the things that I think this study will help with in terms of answering that question is answering the sequencing question. Is it best to use selpercatinib first um, or should we be using a nonspecific therapy first? Um, so um, hopefully we'll be able to enroll in this trial in the U.S. So I'm going to wrap things up um, and just conclude very briefly. Um, you know, we do have several multikinase inhibitors that are our established therapies across the advanced thyroid cancers that I mentioned. Um, however, these drugs are active, but there are treatment-related adverse events that are imp impactful on our patients' lives. We now have gene-specific therapy um, that have demonstrated in several uh, 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 specific genes um, potent efficacy and, and I think improved tolerability. We're seeing that in RET-driven um, uh, thyroid cancers, NTREC fusion-driven thyroid can cancers, and certainly also in BRAF mutant anaplastic thyroid cancer. I really think that this gene-specific therapy is, an, is a new standard of care for these patients. And I think that we really need to identify um, these patients with genotyping. Um, so we consider it a standard in, in our institution to do genotyping in all patients with advanced thyroid cancer um, who were preparing for systemic therapy. Um, and now we have a new problem uh, emerging in the field, which is acquired resistance. Um, so we're going to be doing clinical trials um, more and more looking at acquired resistance to gene-specific therapy and thyroid cancer in the future. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this really kind invitation to join you all uh, for Grand Rounds. It's a real honor. Uh, Laurie, thank you for an excellent, for an excellent talk. And um, I'm going to give some time for people to uh, do the Q&A. We do have a couple of questions, but uh, let's give a, a little bit of time uh, for people to type their questions. And while we're waiting on the questions, uh, I would just remind you that uh, Grand Round uh, next week is uh, canceled because of Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Uh, on December 2nd, we will resume with uh, a critical updates on clinical research from the Winship uh, Clinical Trial Office. Uh, and then of course, to, to, to view the future lectures, please visit the Grand Round uh, page. Now, Lori, uh, this is an excellent talk. And uh, you know, I think the title is very telling, which is that thyroid cancer seems to be the poster child for precision oncology. Uh, and uh, my, my, my question is, um, you know, the, the, and you touched a lot on it, is the specific TKIs versus the none the non or the dirty ones. And um, do we know if the non-specific ones, what is the response rate, for example, or clinical activity in the mutated, in the red mutant versus non-mutant when you use the non-specific ones? I mean, do we know if the activity, because many of these patients when they failed the non-specific, they ended up on the RET 
and they responded. But the, 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 so if you reverse the question uh, and ask, you know, what is the activity of these agents in, in the red mutant versus non-mutant, do we know? Yeah, so that's a, that, that, that is a great question, and, and we do have data on that, both from the cabozatinib trial and the vandatinib trial. Um, the vandatinib trial um, was an, an older study, and so the, the um, uh, gene sequencing for RET um, was not quite as sophisticated at the time, so we don't have the RET status in as many of the patients that were on the vandatinib trial as we do for the cabozatinib trial, um, but we know that um, about about 40 plus percent of the patients on vandatinib did have a RET fusion, I mean a RET mutation, um, and then 30 percent are RET unknown, and then there were like 5 percent of patients that were known to not have a RET mutation. Um, so, and then there were more patients overall in cabozatinib that were known, and about 50% of patients in the CABO trial had RET mutations. Um, about 30% were known to not have RET mutations, and then there was a group of patients that were unknown as well. And in both trials, both drugs had activity in both the RET mutant population and in the RET uh, wild type population. So that goes to, I think, that there is some activity from the other kinase inhibition, probably from the anti-angiogenesis aspect of those drugs. Um, and th then one other uh, little tidbit on, on the RET status from the CABO trial, um, subset analysis showed that um, the patients that had RET M918T actually had an overall survival benefit um, on therapy um, compared to uh, uh, MT patients with M918T that were randomized to placebo. Um, so you, there's maybe a little bit of bonus activity with CABO um, if, you have a, if you do have the RET M918T mutation. So when the uh, uh, selpercatinib and prosatinib studies were being launched, you know, skeptics were saying, yeah, but, you know, you get um, that you're, if you're dropping out VEGFR2 inhibition, um, how do you know that these drugs are going to work because of the cabozantinib and vendetinib experience? Um, and now the, the, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, so I guess we'll wait for this randomized trial. I'm glad, I'm very glad you gave some time for questions because we do have quite a few questions that are being uh, posed. I'm going to go in order. Dr. Donald Harvey is asking, uh, about why uh, discontinuation or holding the dose is so common in thyroid cancer, uh, whereas, uh, you know, given the activity of these uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, drug development could possibly be, uh, have been done maybe in a better uh, way without these frequent discontinuations. Or ah, that's, so that's a really good question. Um, so I, so I had wondered that too, and and I don't I don't know that this is truly the answer, but. You know, the way that we develop drugs, of course, in oncology is these phase one studies where we increase it, the dose and increase and increase and increase until we get to an intolerable dose and maybe back down or stay there. And, um, and so, and those phase one studies are done in, in various tumor types. Um, and so I think that because patients with thyroid cancer do, um, um, are generally more asymptomatic overall and do have um, uh, slightly more indolently growing cancers. Patients with thyroid cancer tend to be on these drugs longer. And so the toll that um, diarrhea, anorexia, fatigue take on somebody say with renal cell cancer um, who's on a drug like, like um, cabozantinib maybe for a median of six months is gonna be different than the toll that the same drug the same dose is going to take on somebody with thyroid cancer who's on it for 16 months, 14 months. And so I think that that's one reason why we do see um, uh, dose reductions and dose discontinuations a lot in, in these thyroid cancer patient studies. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, question, well, is this the, are these the right doses then? Um, 
with lenvatinib, we do know now, based on randomized phase three data, that the starting dose of 24 milligrams is the right starting dose in patients with thyroid cancer. There was a, uh, a post-approval mandated trial that AZI did comparing lenvatinib at 24 milligrams versus 18 milligrams in thyroid cancer patients. And there was a better overall survival benefit uh, or, or overall survival was improved uh, with this uh, full starting dose. And so I think to me, what that means is that we want to use the FDA approved starting dose. And then some patients do need to have dose continue, discontinuation. And we do that in oncology all the time. So we tailor the therapy to the individual patients um, by dose reductions when we need to. Great, thank you. Dr. Ned Waller, um, his question is along the same lines of what you have discussed and we've discussed briefly. Um, what do you think is the future of the dirty kinase inhibitors? Do we, do we believe that those are uh, over given the very highly selective RET and NTRAC inhibitors activities? Uh, well, um, no, I don't think so. Um, you know, uh, lenvatinib has been studied in combination with pembrolizumab um, in multiple solid tumors and um, certainly looks very promising. It's now approved in endometrial cancer. Um, there was a, a, a small study that has been done by the International Thyroid Oncology Group looking at pembro plus lenvatinib in DTC. There was a cohort of patients too that had progressed on lenvatinib and then continued on lenvatinib and Pembro was added in. That was reported at ESMO. Um, um, and then um, Pembro and lenvatinib in combination have been studied in, in poorly differentiated in anaplastic thyroid cancer and reported by a German group at ESMO, um, showing very good activity in, in, in that small um, study. So um, MD Anderson is, is doing a combination study of Pembro, lenvatinib, and in, in anaplastic thyroid cancer. So, you know, I think with Lenvatinib, the overall response rate is 65%, and the, the um, median PFS is, is 18 months. It's a good drug. Um, so, um, so I don't think that the drugs are going to go away, um, um, but you know, they may become second-line drugs or, or, or third-line drugs for, for some patients. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll, begin, we'll develop better ways of targeting the other common um, alterations that are druggable, like, like the RAS mutations that we see in follicular thyroid cancers. And so we'll have, have more cool drugs, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Right. And let's not forget uh, other solid tumors, as you said, Laurie, where these drugs are, you know, especially in combination with immunotherapy are making headways. Dr. Yeah. Regu Halkar, uh, I'm going to try to find the question here. Uh, epidemiologically, do we think there is increase now in metastatic uh, radioiodine refractory disease? Or is, this a, is, is there an epidemiologic investigation? I know you looked at that uh, in your yeah. mentioned that. In my clinic, there is. <laughs> uh, there, we've got patients crawling out of the woodwork. Um, so I have a warped perspective, um, but it actually, so so you know, as as that's a good, that, the, I think that the point of the question really is that there's an epidemic of of incidental thyroid cancers that are being diagnosed and, and treating them, and we're, you know most of the thyroid oncology field is going uh, in the direction of of less is more, you know, trying not to um, uh, even biopsy subcentimeter thyroid nodules, only biopsy clinically relevant thyroid nodules. And, and, and doing less surgery, doing less radioactive iodine. Um, and uh, so I, that the, the rapid rise of, of thyroid cancer incidence in, in our population certainly is nearly all related to the epidemic of diagnosis. Um, however, um, uh, Julie so Julianne Sosa and her group um, ha has taken a look at the data and there is actually um, a smaller rise in more um, clinically advanced um, um, thyroid cancers, um, both based on, on size and stage. And there's also a slight uptick in thyroid cancer death as well. Um, so I, I do think that there is a rise, um, but it's a, uh, in the, in the um, more aggressive thyroid cancers um, in our population. Um, but that increase is, is not skyrocketing. It's really kind of inching its way up. Thank you. And do you do you have a sense of, um, you know, worldwide, uh, how accessible these are these drugs to? I mean, I think certainly Europe and parts of uh, the world they are, but you know, 
we've recently visited uh, certain parts where, uh, you know, the concept of treating metastatic disease was not really very, um, very commonly, uh, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Um, well, that I, you know, it, that's such an important issue, and um, and um, the, you know, I, I was recently um, involved in a the Canadian uh, meeting, and and uh, the question of of cost came up, and and one thing that we don't have in the field are cost benefit analyses of of these uh, highly effective and highly expensive therapies. I think that that really needs to be done um, um, for you know uh, health systems um, like Canada or or in, the, in Europe or or Australia, um, and then you know there are um, also questions of equity. For for other parts of the world um, where um, healthcare systems don't um, have uh, as much resources in terms of being able to provide these expensive therapies. Um, so, you know, right now, um, um, selpercatinib is, is approved only in the U.S. Um, it is being reviewed by the EMA. Um, I don't know when it will be approved outside of the U.S., but uh, probably in not, not, a not too distant future. Um, um, and, um, Larotrectinib is approved in, in uh, more globally um, uh, because that came came up earlier than than sulpercatinib. Um, but you know the 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 um, I think the uh, question also is the cost of the expensive NGS testing in in these patients and really you know can our system bear that? Um, you know I don't know whether our system can bear it, but but what I would say is that if it makes sense to do NGS testing for a patient with, with adenocarcinoma of the lung who needs systemic therapy, then it certainly makes sense for a patient with advanced thyroid cancer to do NGS testing when they need uh, advanced, uh, when, when they need systemic therapy because you're, you're, you have a higher hit rate uh, with thyroid cancer patients than you do even with non-small cell lung cancer. We know that it's a standard of care in non-small cell lung cancer. We'll take a couple of more questions. A question from uh, Dr. Dong Shin. Um, excellent talk. Um, given the uh, acquired resistance, uh, any thoughts on combination therapies? Hi, Dong. Um, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so so one of the in with rep. One of the tricky things has been um, drug design to inhibit the um, solvent front mutation and the and the gatekeeper resistance mutation. So, um, from a, a drug chemistry point of view, that's a particularly tricky um, uh, 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 problem, and I don't know that. Um, anyone has solved that problem yet. It, it may be out there but not, and that I'm not aware of, um, but I know it's been a really tricky problem um, for the really smart guys like at Array by a farmer, for example, who, who are really good at this and know a lot more than I do. Um, but so, you know, one of the, one of the um, thoughts is that if you have a, a drug that can overcome the, 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 the solvent front mutation, then you can partner it with selpercatinib um, to um, get to overcome the acquired uh, gatekeeper resistance mutation. So combination therapy just with different RET inhibitors um, is one thing that, that people have considered. Um, there is a case report of a patient with um, non-small cell lung cancer from Mass General with a RET um, fusion who progressed on selpercatinib and was one of the patients that had the, the MET amplification. Um, and that patient was continued on selpercatinib and, and crisotinib was added and um, did respond um, to that combination therapy. So I think that we'll be see seeing some um, more experience with combinations um, with the MET amplification emerging slowly but surely, hopefully slowly, uh, as patients hopefully continue to do well. Okay, a question from Dr. Amy Chen. Uh, for your de novo patients who present with metastatic disease, uh, I guess we see some of these patients, uh, whether papillary or medullary, do you treat systemically first without surgery or do you usually always resort to, to surgery first? I, I love all of your questions. Um, these are, are things that I think are all, uh, you know, we, things that we, we think about all the time. Um, we generally will favor patients having surgery first. Um, for medullary thyroid cancer, the principle there is that um, 
you don't want your patients dying of progressive disease in the neck because that is probably the you know one of the worst ways to go. Um, and Has there ever been these situations where we would not do where you would not recommend surgery. So yeah, so if a if a patient has relatively low burden of disease and a, and, a, and a high burden of metastatic metastatic disease, then we then we would certainly consider starting with a systemic therapy. If patients have very bulky disease and metastatic disease, then um, um, there have now been, um, MD Anderson has a case report out of a patient um, presenting with unresectable disease treated I think with sulpercatinib, um, with MTC, um, had a, a very nice response, went on to then have resection of the disease in the neck, and then resumed uh, therapy for the, to, for the systemic disease. Um, so so um, there's now interest in using these drugs in the neoadjuvant setting for patients with bulky disease to try to um, uh, make the, the unresectable disease more resectable so that you can get the tumor out. Um, for DTC, you want to get the tumor out if you can, um, so because otherwise you can't use radioactive iodine, and um, if you you can't um, because of the, the normal thyroid tissue will just take up all the radioactive iodine, um, and you do want to use radioactive iodine in anybody who uh, in whom uh, there may be some benefit. Um, so so we always try to get the the primary tumor out in, in differentiated thyroid cancer in part for that reason. Okay, well, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lori. Again, we would have wished it would have been in person, but hopefully next time yeah. uh, that would be the case. And I want to thank all the attendees and all the participants for a great questions and a great uh, talk. Thank you so much and happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Saba. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone.